Good morning. We're going to start, uh, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 40. Um, I'm sure none of you would be surprised if I mentioned that uh, today's world, we have a lot of confusion and deception. And I think of that as I think of in the beginning, God made man, male and female. And we all know that today you could be male, female, or whatever you want to be, something else. And therein lies the confusion. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that you are not the author of confusion that you bring wisdom and truth and that your son Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask that you would give us that understanding, protect us from deception as the God of this world goes about sowing deceit and lies and error, trying to uh, keep the unbelieving in unbelief. But we thank you, Father, you're greater. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so we can look to you in confidence. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In fact, one of the lines in that song that was attributed to be the Navy, there was a line there of the Holy Spirit able to bring peace out of a tumultuous sea. And that's the fact that uh, we're in a tumultuous sea in this world. Uh, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we have nothing to fear in that sense as we keep our eyes on Christ. And God gave us tremendous instruction saying, uh, set your mind, if you have the mind of Christ, then you want to keep your mind on things above. And the things above are good and peaceful, patient, kind, correct, the truth. So God instructs us to put our mind on these things. Don't be alert and taken away with the things of the world because it just leads to destruction. In chapter 40, 41 and 42, I was going to go through all three of them, but I think we'll start with 40, see where we get. And uh, we're going to hear from God. We believe that the Bible is God's word. So let us hear what God has to say about himself. Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And we know what day that will be. That day will be the day that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, Jesus is Lord. When Jesus comes again, he will be in his full glory. And everybody, believer and unbeliever, will witness that. And thanks be to God, if we are believers, we will be, God tells us to lift up our head for our redemption draweth nigh when you see all these things going on in the end times. Lift up your head. How can we lift up our head? Because God is our savior himself. He's our savior. So we have no problem lifting up our head to him. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. 
Why is it going to happen? Exactly like that. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God speaks and it is. He said, let there be light. There was light. He made the heavens and the earth. He spoke and it is. He is truth. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as a flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. All flesh will perish. That includes our bodies. These bodies that we spend so much time pruning and taking care of and feeding, doing whatever. It's gonna go. All flesh will perish. All of creation, AI. AI, the ruler of the world today that Satan uses diligently through different means to keep people in uh, deception. AI is going to perish. This earth is going to perish. The heavens are going to perish. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. That which is seen is temporal. That which is not seen is eternal. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Makes you think of the Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd leads his flock. He doesn't drive them, he leads them. And often the flock don't want to follow him, they stray off, but he'll lead the flock and go find that stray one and bring them back, carry him on, carrying him on his shoulder. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And that shepherd also protected that flock from wolves and lions and bears and what, uh, enemies, everything. That shepherd was not only a provider, he was a protector. And so we have the good shepherd as our protector. And it's interesting, he's the good shepherd. Because evidently there were some shepherds that the lion had come and they'd take off. They, well, there go the sheep. You know, let it be. But not the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He laid down his life for us. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and hills in a balance? Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel? Who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment, taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of the understanding? Who? No one. None. There were none. God is almighty, all-knowing, all-wise, infinite in power and wisdom. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. That's all the lands through all the seas. He takes them up as a very little thing. 
And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing. Vanity. You know, the nations take great pride in their strength. We know who's the strongest nation. We claim America. Some claim China. There's others that maybe they claim themselves to be the strongest nation. Whoever they be, and we'll see when they all do gather together, in the end, united against God, there is nothing. There is nothing. They are as nothing. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Our thoughts of God are just way, way, way too small. The highest thought I could have is so small compared to the reality and the truth. Now we're created creatures. We are just created beings. Animals are created. We don't expect a dog, even though he's a loyal, good friend, to comprehend a financial problem I'm going through, having incurred great debt or something and how to work a way out. He has no comprehension of the issue. Can't even begin. He's a dog. We compared to God in our understanding, our thinking, is less than a dog's understanding of us. He can understand our emotions, he can understand our commands, he can understand some different things. He can provide loyalty and friendship, but he doesn't understand our innermost being. We likewise, in relationship to God, we were made in his image. In the image of God, I believe the most important aspect of that image is that he has put into our capacity the ability to understand him to the degree he desires us to understand him. We can understand he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Well, I don't know that we can understand that. We can take it in and we can believe it and we can have feelings about if I had to give up my son for somebody that was trying to murder me, I can say, man, I don't know. You know, that's really going, that's, loving thy neighbor beyond what I would think. But I believe that God has given us the capacity now to understand him fully to the degree we need to understand him now because after we receive a new resurrected body, right now we're born again, we have our new resurrected soul. If we are born again, we have these capacity, we have the mind of Christ. We can understand these things. But I believe that we will continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God for all eternity. That's so exciting because there will always be something new we're learning. And it's going to be for all eternity. Why? Because God himself is infinite. You don't get to the end of infinity. You, you never get there. You go and go, it's going to go. Well, I can't even imagine how glorious that's going to be. Sometimes I have a little flickering insight about God and I get goosebumps, you know, pimples or whatever they call them, bumps. And uh, it's thrilling when God gives you some insight or some understanding of him. How good, how patient, how kind, how faithful, how wonderful he is for us, how strong he is. Well, that's going to go on for eternity. We have that to look forward to. Uh, Forgetting those things which lie behind, press on towards the mark. That's where we're going as believers. We're not occupied in this world with establishing our kingdom here because it's all going to per perish. We're pilgrims and strangers passing through. We're just passing through. We're not pitch and tent. We're not, that's not our purpose. We're passing through. That which is seen is temporal. That which is unseen is eternal. That's God and his kingdom, eternal. 
Uh, okay. Maybe I could remember almost where I was at. Okay, let's... Verse 18. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and cast the silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he has no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to pair, prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens, or as a curtain spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of earth as vanity. Ye that shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Now we read this and we say, yeah, these guys made statues out of wood and put gold on them and they worshiped them. And we say, well, we're not heathen. We're not uh, crude like that. But I believe that all of us have idols in our hearts. We make idols ourselves. Maybe not out of wood and stubble, but we make idols. It may be fame or fortune or something else uh, but uh, most likely we make ourselves our idol that's probably the biggest idol is ourselves we want to do what we want to do as opposed to what God would have us do therein lies probably most of us our problem to whom then will you liken me or whom shall I be equal saith the Holy One lift up your eyes on high behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. He's talking about the heavens and all the creations of the heavens. And first we had the Hubble telescope that first Galileo, he saw there was, I think it was Galileo, somebody at one time saw that there were some other planets and at that day, they thought we were the center of the universe. The church did. And Galileo said, no, we're not the center. Well, he got hung for that. The church killed him because he disagreed that we were not the center of the universe. But then later, many years later, not too many years ago, we came up with the Hubble. And the Hubble, boom, it exploded things way out there. Well, then we saw there were not only other planets, not, there were whole other galaxies, whole, you know, un, innumerable galaxies. And now we have this new Webb telescope that I think is even bringing more information in that's showing a lot of uh, new things which involve quantum physics and a uh, whole bunch of stuff so that they're having to reconsider a lot of the basic scientific information they established our science on. Now they have to re-look at that because it's not proving to be absolutely correct. So what God is telling us here that he all this he had made in the six days, I believe. He spoke and it was created. And he had the power and not one of them faileth. Uh, in fact, the most recent science issue is, I think there's, uh, we sent some people up in a rocket ship to the International Space Station and 
we can't get them back the way they were supposed to come back. So now we're setting up another thing to rescue them to get them back. And that's just going to the space station. That's not going to another galaxy. But these are the finest scientists and people that work on these things, very knowledgeable and very expert. But their attempts fail. And God is making sure, he says here, not one faileth of all his creation. I don't, if you're familiar at all with any kind of biology, you know that there's ecosystems. You get this little newt in a river, and it's just a little thing, but there's probably in his ecosystem and his involvement in the ecosystem, without him there, the whole thing would collapse. Uh, it, it's so complex and so entailed, and God did it in a breath, just spoke and it was done. So not only for that he is strong in power and not one faileth, why sayest thou, O Jacob, speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? So now God is asking, and Jacob and Israel would be in the church of the day, they're, they're saying, yeah, we believe, but you know, our ways are hid of the Lord. He doesn't see what we do. We don't really have to uh, confess, face up right away. Makes me think of when Jesus confronted them. And he said, you say that a man should not lay with a woman or commit adultery. I say that a man that looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery. Boy, he just raised the scale a thousand degrees. So even the Old Testament scribes and Pharisees who held to the law, they claimed, having perverted it by trying to obey it, they thought God gave it to them to, for their salvation. Jesus showed them, no, it's not the scriptures that save you. It's the one the scriptures are pointing to that saves you. The Bible doesn't save you. The one the Bible is pointing to saves you. Jesus said, search the scriptures. In them you think you will have life. But you don't have life there. Because those scriptures speak of me, said Jesus, but you will not come to me that you might have life. Therein was their failure. They didn't believe that. In fact, they opposed that so much, they crucified and killed the very Savior they said they were looking for, the Messiah that was to come. He was there, and they did not recognize him, even though they knew the scriptures. So God is teaching us that, why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord. My judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now these are all positive statements for us who claim God is our God. The God of the Bible is our God. That's what we claim. That's who I'm following. The God of Jacob and Abraham, the Father of Jesus, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God that is revealed in the Bible. This is who we are following. Following. This is who we are seeking. This is who we are putting our life, our whole life, all of our life, not our works, not our understanding, not our trust in our wisdom, but in the person of God, who is the God of the Bible. Therein is salvation. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. 
He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might. He increases strength. That made me think of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where remember Paul was uh, hindered. He was being hindered by Satan. And I believe he called it a thorn in the side. And uh, he besought God to remove the thorn from his side. And he prayed, he said, three times to that end. And God responded. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. For this thing, well, let's read up here, start at verse seven. And lest I should be exalted above measure through abundance of the revelations, God had given Paul a lot of revelations. And one of the revelations was of the third heaven. And he even revealed to him some things that couldn't even be repeated. So Paul is explaining here, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. And a lot of people wonder, what's that thorn in the flesh? Well, right here, God is telling us what that thorn is. It's a messenger of Satan. That was the thorn of the flesh. And why? To buffet me. That's why God gave it to Paul. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, this is what God told Paul when Paul said, could you relieve this thorn from Satan? Can you relieve this from me? And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. We go about all the time trying to be strong. We want to be stronger in our strength and our might. We want to be something. God is teaching us here. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. That means except we become as little children, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Little children know they're weak. They look to dad, to mom. They look for help. Help, help. That's how we ought to be. Looking to God. Help, have mercy. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may be upon me. Now Paul's saying he glories in his infirmity in his lack of strength, because it, he understands he's dependent then upon God. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. And brothers and sisters, I'm talking to you today because we're in and even entering into a greater time of confusion, deceit, distress for those that claim the truth. I will not be surprised if Christians go to jail in America for proclaiming the truth. That will not, I will not be surprised if that happens in America, which was founded upon the truth, supposedly. Our forefathers claimed that they believed the truth of the scriptures and based most of our government functioning on those things. But the government has, and the people who are, and we're the government, so I can't blame the government because we are the government. But the people of the government of years of late have said, hey, get rid of that. No, we don't want to have Bible in the school. We don't want God, separate God there. Get him out of the schools, take him out. We don't want it. So, that's, I believe, this passage in verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. In necessities makes me think of there's a passage that talks about when the Antichrist has manifested, 
then people, unless they have the mark of the beast, cannot buy or sell. You won't be permitted to buy or sell unless you take the mark of the beast. That's as I understand it. I don't know how that's going to work out, but assuming it is, well, then you're going to have some necessities. God said in those days there will be famines and uh, wars and rumors of wars, trials and tribulations. So therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and approaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Why? It's for Christ's sake, not for our own sake. If you go to jail because you broke the speed limit, you're going there for your own sake. If you go to jail because you were a witness on the street corner and somebody said you were just causing a commotion of disruption in society and you go to jail, well then that's for Christ's sake. That could be legitimate. Or if, like uh, when the COVID came, it said the churches were to close. And uh, well, I, I don't wanna get off that. So verse 11, I am become a fool in glory in. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So, here God is telling us that uh, He is our strength. We are strong in Him when we are trusting Him. We don't have any strength of our own. Our strength is Jesus Christ. Back to Isaiah 41 and verse 29, he giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These are those that wait upon the Lord. That's where the strength is coming from, waiting upon the Lord. And that takes strength. It reminds me of the passage, and I think I might have addressed that in the last message, how we're to stand against the wiles of the devil with the full armor of God. He says, stand therefore. And we take the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, girdle our Sells with the girdle of truth, shot our feet with the feet, with the shoes of peace. These are all Jesus Christ. All these things, because when we become born again, we are in Christ Jesus. We have a union with him. And so when we stand against the wiles of the devil, which we're talking about in these end days, he has brought deceit and deception. The wiles of the devil, the way we stand, is in our weakness, in the strength of Christ. We have salvation, we have the truth, we have righteousness. All of these are a gift. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. All of these armor pieces are gifts from God, ours to receive. We simply receive. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them. We don't even maintain them. God does this. This is God doing for us. Okay, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 21. Luke 21 is telling us, it's also Matthew 24, but... Luke 21 is telling us about the end days. And I'm addressing this issue because I do believe that uh, we're, if not in that time, approaching that time. I think that it's going to get worse as it goes. It doesn't all start out full blown, but uh, Luke 21 beginning at verse uh, 5. Verse 5, 
And some spake of the temple. Here, uh, Jesus had, uh, was at the temple and he saw a widow cast in a mite and rich men put a lot of money in and he, he commended the widow because she gave all that she had where they were just given their surplus. And it didn't hurt them at all to give surplus, but she gave all she had, the mite. So he commends her. And some spake of the temple, how it adorned with goodly stones, gifts. He said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So it's going to crumble. The temple's going to crumble. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what signs will there be when these things shall come to pass? He said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. Take heed that ye not be not deceived. Well, how would you be deceived? Because there's a great deceiver, and he's Satan. And believe me, he's more deceptive than you and I are clever and wise to not be deceived by. He's been around a long time. He has a lot of influence and a lot of pressure he can put on. And we cannot stand against him ourselves. We could be easily deceived. Maybe have been numerous times. But thanks be to God, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. So therein lies our safety. We become like little children. Oh Lord, I'm not sure, I'm a little, what's going on here? I'm confused. Give me wisdom, give me truth, protect me, keep me from being deceived. And he said, take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass. Now this is God telling us these things will come to pass. Don't think that all of a sudden it's just going to be all peace. Now I know that there's a scenario that there's going to be the Antichrist going to unite nations and He's going to bring a council of peace and after a few years that's going to break down and so on and so on. But the thing is, we don't need to be involved in all that kind of detail as opposed to knowing what God has told us. And this is what he tells us. When you see these things, don't be terrified. These things must first, and he says first, that's an important word there. These things must first come to pass. That means something second is coming. This must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So you're, even if we think the end is coming, these are the first things that we're seeing. It's not now. It's not yet done. It's just beginning. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, this word nation here in the Hebrew or the Greek is race against race. It's not nation against nation. It's race against race, which often nations identify maybe as a race, but there's many races in many nations. And so it's really race against race. And uh, there's been racial turmoil all over. We see it in America. We think of black and white uh, race issue, but in Africa, it's tribe against tribe. And so when you think about it, it's not surprising that there's going to be more so than ever before, because when Adam and Eve conceived after they had fallen, the first son murdered the second guy. Right off the bat, that's what you get. Mankind sins, the first significant issue, Cain killed Abel. Boom. First thing. Why? He was a sinner. I thought it was the wages of death is sin. I thought it was because uh, Satan wanted to get rid of the line that was going to bring Jesus. 
Well, Jesus didn't come through that second child. He came through the third son born. Right, but he killed us. Oh, the motivation for it. The motivation, yeah. The motivation for it could be that because we see Pharaoh tried to kill uh, the Jewish boys when they were born, I think probably for the same reason. There's a couple of instances throughout the scripture that identify that Satan does want to kill. There's been the warfare from the very beginning of Satan, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So... In verse 8, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, the time draweth near. Go ye therefore not, go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And therein lies, it's the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. That's the warfare. And that's how we're to stand against the kingdom of darkness because we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light if we're born again. God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light. Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines and pestilences, fearful sighs, sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. So he's saying before all this transpires, they will be laying their hands on you. And the fact, he was speaking to his disciples, and they did have hands laid on them. They were imprisoned, beat, shipwrecked, uh, killed, murdered. So this had been fulfilled already in the disciples, but will also continue to be filled in the warfare of the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and into prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. That's why it's taking place for his name's sake. If we're not faithful, we don't have to worry about it. We're not going to be persecuted. But if we are faithful to declare as his ambassadors, Jesus said, the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus Christ was persecuted because he came to reveal the Father. Men love darkness rather than light. He came unto his own and they loved darkness rather than light. They did not receive him. We go into the world, the world will not receive us. The world loves darkness rather than light. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts. Now, he's telling us what to settle in our hearts. Not to meditate before what ye shall answer. Don't work up some big rigmarole of what you're going to answer. There's a verse that says we should be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies in us. With meekness and gentleness. The hope that lies in us, the answer is Jesus Christ. That's the hope that lies in us, Jesus Christ. He is the hope that has already gone in to the holy place. He is our great high priest who intercedes for us. Sell it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom 
which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren, kinsfolk, friends. Some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish, if you're in your patience possess your souls. And ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them which are in the countries enter therein. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. All things that are written may be fulfilled. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's word will not pass away. But woe unto them that are with child, to them which give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the end, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man. So it's after all of that is going on, then, and this is both believers and unbelievers, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, when it begins before he comes, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Our redemption draweth nigh. Now if we, if we die before these things take part, therein our redemption draweth nigh. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I want to read uh, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Beginning at verse 7. This is speaking about Jesus Christ. The word of God is our high priest. And again, he limiteth a certain day in David today after so long a time. As it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, and that Jesus should have been Joshua, because that's who it's referring to. Jesus and Joshua are the same name. For if Jesus had given rest, them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he is also seized from his own works, as God did from his. So God is telling us that if we seize from our works, which we do, we are Excuse me. We seize from our works because Jesus Christ did the work for us. We're not trying to enter heaven by our good works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. If we're saved, it's because God has made himself known to us as the savior and given us a heart to incline to believe him, trust him and rest our hope in him. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken another day. 
There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has seized from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Almost sounds contradictory, huh? Let us labor to enter into that rest. What is the labor? The labor, I believe, is unbelief. We're laboring because we, it's hard to believe that God freely gives us salvation. He said his son died. His son paid for it. His son arose again from the dead. It's a gift. We inherit salvation. It's an inheritance. It's free. We don't work for it. We don't earn it. We don't maintain it. We got to labor because it's so contrary to our natural inclination as sinners thinking you get what you deserve. That's only fair. Well, thanks be to God, God is not fair. If he was fair, then we would pay our own way. But he's merciful and good. He's beyond fair, merciful and good. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That's how you fall, unbelief. That's what Satan is all about. That's what Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. Did God say, oh, you surely won't die. God said, you eat of the fruit of the knowledge true and e of good and evil, you will die. So he said, no, come on, you won't die. You'll become like God. Therein is the lie, the deceit, the deception. Eve believed the lie. Adam chose the lie. They fell. They died. They were cast out of Eden. That's why we must be born again. Being born again is we have physical life, but not spiritual life. Born again is being spiritually born again as a child of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes with whom we have to do. God sees everything. He knows everything. No sense trying to hide a sin from God. Don't worry about having to confess it. He already knows it. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Therein is our hope. We have a great high priest. He represents us. He is our righteousness. He is our salvation. In fact, I'm going to end up, we'll read uh, 1 Corinthians. Let me finish this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, which means he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And we have a lot of infirmities. A lot of infirmities. He can be touched by them, is touched by them. Good, kind, merciful. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace because we are so stinking good. I don't believe that's what it says. Let us therefore come unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. God is so good that he sent his son to die for the ungodly. Not the godly, the ungodly. While we were dead in trespass and sins, he died for us. While we were his yes enemies, while we had no strength. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Remember that grace that Paul prayed he prayed for something and God gave him grace and that grace was his salvation and Paul rejoiced in that grace and claimed that grace. Uh, I'll end with this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 29, three verses. Uh, two 
two verses, 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God, that's Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's what Christ Jesus is to us. He is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. That is it. As it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Father, again, <clears throat> forgive us our unbelief. Help us to believe what you tell us. Give us hearts that really desire to worship you in truth and in spirit. We know except you do that work in us, we would fail. We have no strength of our own. We thank you that you have made provision for every aspect of our salvation and our full salvation. But while yet here in these sinful bodies, Father, help us to be faithful to be your ambassadors, to direct others to you, not to us. Oh, Lord, help us to be lights in this dark, dark world, bearing the light of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.